Fantastic. Now, uh, do you remember uh, when you enlisted in the nurse corps? Yes, it was in uh, 1941, and everybody was getting drafted to go into the service, and everybody was going in for a year. So I got out of nurses training, so I volunteered to go for a year. My father wasn't very happy that I was going in the service, but I went in and I, I read it out of Elkhart, Indiana, and I had to go down to Indianapolis, and then I, just to be inducted, and then I went to Charleston, South Carolina for my first place where I was. Now, uh, what were your reasons for joining the service? Oh, I just, it was a thing to do then. They needed nurses, and I was sort of footloose, and I thought it was a good idea. Did you have any brothers or sisters who enlisted? No, no. And uh, what was basic training like for a nurse? Really nothing. When we, when they finally set us up in the hospital, they weren't really ready for us. When I got to Charleston, there wasn't any hospital even built. I arrived there at 10 o'clock at night. Nobody knew I was coming. I went there by myself and uh, on the train, and they had to try and find somebody. And all the nurses were coming in, and there was no hospital built. So they finally sent us all to Columbia for three months till they built a hospital. They had all wooden barracks. And then we went back there. And I think twice they had us out on the field to march. Big disaster. <laughs> Nobody knew anything. The yeah. fellow would put his hands in and say, ladies, you know, he's so mad. And then we didn't have to do anything. <laughs> From that point on? From that point on, no. Now, uh, how long did you remain in the States until you uh, deployed overseas? I was, I went over and I was two years in South Carolina, Charleston, which is a lovely city, but hot. <laughs> and then on April of 1943, we uh, left New York and sailed for North Africa. So that was two years and uh, almost. Where did you uh, first land in North Africa? In Iran. And... Uh, Loads of hospital, every loads of hospital units were going over at the same time, and uh, we landed in Iran and just out on a hill that they called Goat Hill. Mm -hmm. There was no place for anybody. That we just had to sleep on the ground the first few nights on a blanket, and then they set up a hospital tent and they put beds up, but there no mattresses or brains or anything, and uh, we had a cook our own meals for a few days, and one of the disasters that happened to me is they gave us sea rations, and uh, we were supposed to heat them, and I was never a Girl Scout. I didn't know you had to open a can before you put it on the fire, and I put a can of meat and beans, and the thing exploded. <laughs> all, you won't believe how a small can of meat and beans can go all over. Is that your first medical emergency? <laughs> That's my first <laughs> That was the only time I got injured in the service. I didn't get a purple star for that, though. Uh, how long was it before uh, the Army set up medical facilities for you to begin staffing? Uh, I don't know. We were. They finally set up tents, and we were there uh, for. Uh, we might have been there close to a month. They were. All of these hospital units, everything was coming over because they were getting ready for the, the war in Italy, of course. And uh, one that, when we were first there, we would go into Iran. The officers club, the Red Cross had an officers club there, and we'd meet people. And the uh, the Red Cross sent out uh, ice cream for us to have. We had food, and everybody ate ice cream. And two thirds of the people had food poisoning from things, so that was. It. And I ended up being carted off in a hospital, thinking I'd probably die, and my parents would know. People were dropping like flies; they were so sick. And the next day, all the brass from town were out, and we had latrines with no screens or anything. And then they really fixed it up. And then I can't really remember how long we stayed there before. 
we got on trains and went, our outfit went to Bari. And the hospital units were going all over. Now uh, at the time, um, like you said, uh, the army was preparing to invade Italy. How long was it before you started receiving uh, battlefield casualties at your station? Well, we were there from uh, May of 44, uh, May of 43 till July of 44. And as soon as we set up our hospital outside of Algiers, we started getting patients that were getting hurt in Italy where they were taking anzio and all. And we were a staging hospital, so we, we also took care of people. There were a lot of army personnel around and just a regular hospital, we took care of people. And we took care of some Italian prisoners of war from North Africa. But uh, patients would get hurt in Italy. And then when they had enough of them, they would send them by hospital boat to us. And then we would take care of them until a big hospital ship came to send them back to the United States. And one time, I think we got about 300 patients delivered to us, but a lot of them were in casts and They'd been taken care of, but they, we had to take care of them until they could go home. So. Now, uh, what exactly did you do at the field hospital? What was your position? Pardon? What was your role in the uh, field hospital? Well, part of the time I took care of patients, and then towards the end I was working in the operating room some of the time. But we'd just take care of patients and work nights or days, and we'd have a nurse, and there'd be, of course, Corpsmen would be really like uh, would would be taking care of the patients, but we were the nurses for it. There'd be one nurse for several tents, you know. But. So, if you could, um, could you describe uh, what would be your most uh, ordinary day to day experience at one of these field hospitals? Like how would the day start and then continue from that point? Well, I think we get up and. Uh, when we lived in we were lived in tents, we'd have to get in a, a truck then to go to the hospital area, and uh, we'd take care of the patients, and and then we'd come back. Of course, we had an officers' club down by the water, so we had time to go over there sometimes, and we had some fun. We were right down the beach, so you could sometimes go to the beach. Now, uh, being an army hospital, uh, would they serve alcohol at the officers' club? Pardon? Uh, would they serve alcohol at the officers' club? Yes, they did serve officers' club. When we were in Charleston, you would go to the officers' club, but that was uh, you had to buy your own liquid there, but because uh, that was a dry place. But there was an officers' club. And uh, what did you do for recreation besides uh, swimming? Well, we just we would go to the beach sometimes and. Uh, some of the people took vacation and went to the desert. I didn't go to that, but, and I knew some, I had met a fellow on the, in the boat when I was coming overseas. Uh, he was an aide to the general, and uh, he came to visit me. Then he went on to uh, France, but he came over to visit me. He was picking up a new car for the general. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a new car and he had to wait till he could take it back. So. He came, picked me up, and we'd drive around in the car. We went out to the airport to get gas. At the same time, my father wrote me that his brother had died 15 miles away from us in South Bend, Indiana. He couldn't get any gas to go to the funeral. And my folks are feeling sorry for me, and I'm riding around in the command car. <laughs> so it's funny, you know, there's good and bad stuff in, in all of it. Uh, and I'll tell you, a funny joke, or not a joke, but when I was going overseas and I, I met this one officer that was aide to the general, and then when we, all of us went to the uh, officers club in Iran and uh, at the Red Cross, and there was all the officers and there were all the nurses and everybody was just friendly, you know, like going to a bar, I guess. And I met this other fellow who was, ended up, uh, he was a, uh, intelligence officer. And I had told the fellow, I, my name is Mary Elizabeth, 
And I grew up being Elizabeth, but went in the Army, you had to go by first name and muzzle initial. So finally, I was Mary E., but a lot of people, I told them my name was Elizabeth. So going overseas in a boat, I told this person, the aide to the general, that my name was Elizabeth. And I told the person that I the, uh, uh, met at the officer's club, my name was Mary. And at night, a lot of the people, this is while we're still in Iran, at night, a lot of the officers come out where all of the hospital outfits are, and that's where the nurses are and everything. And this is a real true story that Willie, the office, the intelligence officer, had a jeep, and he's picking up some fellow that's thumbing his way, and he picks up Larry, my other friend, and he, they both come to where I am, <laughs> one is, and we all laughed about that. But if you put that in a movie, nobody would believe that. <laughs> so we would have we'd have parties and get together and stuff. And uh, you didn't do a lot of fancy stuff, go places. And uh, in that part of military history uh, for the U.S. Army, were there any restrictions on uh, the fraternization between male and female soldiers? No, there were, of course, no female soldiers that we took care of. There were no women in the frontline services, so most of them were all just nurses. We didn't, we weren't in a place where there were any wax or waves that we took care of in the hospitals. They were just the army nurses. And uh, were there any restrictions on um, you associating with male uh, officers? No, we could go with those, yeah. We weren't supposed to go with non-commissioned officers. So some of the nurses did date non-commissioned officers. Through the cracks. Some of those non-commissioned officers were professors or, you know, they were well-educated people too, or pharmacists or something, but some of them hadn't gone to officer's training school. So uh, where was the Army mostly recruiting from for the uh, medical staff? Uh, for most of the doctors that you worked with? Uh, where had they come from, where they received their education? Oh, they really came from all over, except when I went to the 26th General in Bari. That was a University of Minnesota group, and so those were mostly the doctors that were involved from the University of Minnesota. Otherwise, they just came from all over. There were no special people. And at that point, I remember you discussed that um, you never really uh, interacted with any wasps or waves while you were over there. But uh, and at the time, uh, the United States didn't have any uh, women uh, in frontline combat. But um, did you ever receive any casualties among your unit? No, no, we didn't. And I never heard of any nurses being killed. We had a couple nurses in. Uh, Italy that died from uh, hepatitis. There was a great spread of hepatitis there in Germany, and uh, but uh, no, I didn't know anybody that was hurt. And uh, during the war, uh, how close did you? Um, how close were you positioned to the battlefield? Well, when I was in northern Italy, uh, we were we were close. They were trying, where we were in northern Italy, they were trying to take Bologna. It was towards, we were, that was say from October 44 through uh, January and February and March, I think, of 45. And they were all frontline hospitals. And as the line moved up, then the back hospitals would move. And so uh, when we were in uh, Via Reggio, which was with the hundred and uh, 70th Evacuation Hospital. The hospital was set up by a, a ammunition depot, which should, should never have been. You shouldn't put a hospital. We had big tents with great big red crosses, but they were, Germans were firing from, somebody said 20 miles away, I don't know. But we got a direct hit in our hospital one night, and one of the patients were killed, and so they shouldn't have been there. And then about three days later, they moved our hospital 
in Toluca and put it in a side of a soccer stadium. So it was safer there. But uh, that was the closest I came. But we could hear the when they were shooting and all. And that night when we had the hospital hit, I was working nights and we were operating and we kept moving down lower and lower as we could hear the number. Finally, they would stop operating and we put the patients on the floor and then turned the operating room tables up on the side, the metal ones, to protect the patients. And then we all just had to lie flat on the, on the floor till morning. When daylight came, you could see the holes in the tent from the shrapnel, you know, small holes. But that, that was my only time to be really close. Now, uh, were you issued any kind of protective equipment? You know, helmets? Oh, yes. And yeah, everybody had a helmet, and, and we all had a, a, well, let's see, well, mostly a helmet. We all had canteens. Everybody had a, your own canteen to carry that. But we didn't have any other equipment because they didn't expect us to get hit. <laughs> now, um, as for uniforms, uh, did men and women in these medical services more or less dress according to the same apparel in the same standard army uniform? They just wore like the fellows wore like fatigues and we at one time wore uh, part of the time the summer brown and white uh, seersucker uniforms. And then uh, we also, but when we were in the frontline hospitals, we all had done uh, wool pants and like a cover over those and wool shirts and stuff. So, of course, you go to the operating room, you know, where you get dressed for that. But uh, other than that, we wear that. One of the things it's hard for me to remember is how we did with laundry all the years I was over. I know when we were in North Africa, we would send them down to the French ladies and they would do our laundry and we would give them bars of soap. They were happy to get that. And then we also had to pay them. But, uh, uh, and in the front lines, when we were there, I remember once we were all putting uh, trucks and we were sent some to her. There's big semi, like semi trucks and you walked in the back end of the truck and you got new clothes, your size of uniform. You walked through, you had a beautiful hot shower and all, and then you got on clean clothes and then you went back. But I don't remember doing that once, so I don't know how we, <laughs> I guess we probably didn't take too many showers at the front line. <laughs> so how would wounded soldiers uh, arrive at your medical facilities? They would all come in ambulances, and uh, and we when they would come, they would have probably been taken care of a little bit out in the field and put in ambulances and brought to the hospital. And then they had a trauma unit, and they would figure out which ones need to be cared for first, and they'd be X-rayed, and then they would come into the operating room, and we'd operate on them. Then we probably wouldn't see them again, and we would. So where operate. would you go for uh, outpatient care? What was that where they would wait for uh, hospital ships going back to the United States? Then they would stay with us until uh, uh, they would, I suppose they went somewhere else and got another hospital ship somewhere to be sent home. Now, um, how, uh, what's the furthest um, you ever uh, received casualties from? I already said your position close, uh, well, behind the front lines of the Italian campaign. But uh, what's the furthest you ever received a patient from? Well, I think when they were trying to take Bologna's, to, that's to, towards the end of the war, that's where I think we got most of our casualties that time. And maybe they were trying to take that. It was in northern Italy, whatever they were trying to take. We were up in that area. And uh, would you take soldiers from all walks of life, uh, infantry, air crew? Well, we, everything was infantry. Now, when I was in, in Barry at Layette, that was when I was in the front lines. I wasn't in the front lines all the time. When I was stationed in Barry at Lee with the 26th General Hospital, we were on the Adriatic 
side, Varius, and all up and down the Adriatic side there were airfields, and they were all flying over to bomb the Romanian air, their, their, their oil fields. And as a lot of the planes would get hit, and we'd have a lot of patients would have bad burns, and then they would come down and we would take care of those They were that would have gotten hurt in the, on the flights. So that was a lot of what we did in Bari. And then we had to do a lot of skin grafts and things like that on them that had burns. There's always different kinds of things in different places. Now, um, besides the, uh, the indirect fire that you received uh, when you were doing the ammunition depot, uh, did you ever feel as though your life was in danger working at the hospitals? Well, when we got the direct hit in our hospital, of course, they we went back to our own tents, and they were right there, and they took foxholes for us in our tents. And we had to sleep in foxholes until they... And I think we were moved in four or five days. But uh, we put our uh, bedroll down and a blanket, and... I got in the foxhole, I slept very well, <laughs> and it was right inside of our tent. <laughs> so did you do anything for good luck? No, no. I, it's funny, you know, you you never felt, you feel immortal. I guess you think you're young and nothing's going to happen to you. I never, I never was scared that, of that. the only time I was really scared is when I had the food poisoning, and I thought I might die. <laughs> Other than that, I, I wasn't uh, scared of anything. And while I was in the front lines and at the soccer stadium at Christmas time, you say, what do you do for entertainment? Well, I knew this intelligence officer who uh, ran a prison, who was the, uh, the intelligence, he was one of the ones that would inter interrogate the prisoners at a big... Uh, prison in Florence. And so at Christmas time, they were going to have a dance there. And so he sent a command car over for me and another nurse. And I'd sent my, I'd written to my family to send me an evening gown and they sent it to me. And we went to the dance on Christmas Eve. And uh, we were the only Americans. The rest of the fellows were all dating Italian girls. And uh, we had a great time, beautiful meal and dancing and everything. And then we they had to send us back in the command car. And so I was gone all that night, Christmas night, you know. And my poor parents are probably worrying about what's happening to me on Christmas Eve. And I'm having a good time. <laughs> and then I got home and I had to work the next day. And I felt very guilty because I'd never even gone. I'm a Catholic. I didn't get to Mass that day because I had to work. And I, but I had a good time. And, and when I came home from the service, the uh, newspaper came to visit me. And it was before Christmas. And so they set me down in front of a Christmas tree on the floor. And they had me wrapping packages and how they set it up. And then they say, you know, uh, Mary Elizabeth, you know, December 25th, pain and suffering and all this. And I'm embarrassed because I was having a good time on Christmas. I wasn't having any pain or suffering at all. So you can't always tell when you see pictures. But. So when you talk about that, um, <clears throat> you know, that pain and suffering and, you know, the lack of it in the Army, you know, just um, or, uh, holiday parties, uh, was it like that in general? How well were you supplied? while you were in the service. How well was I, bud? Uh, how well were you supplied uh, in terms of uh, medical equipment? We always, clothing? as far as I know, we always had medical equipment. And it, we always had a PX. You could get stuff, you know. There's a lot of stuff. You couldn't get, one of the worst things for the nurses when we went over there, you couldn't get any, the water was so hard, you couldn't get any shampoo. We had a terrible time trying to wash our hair, <laughs> things like that, you know little things, but uh, you didn't need a lot, really. And uh, then I, if I need, you know, I was over these two and a half years, if I needed shoes or something, I would able to get a ration thing and send it to my parents, so they would buy me something to send me. 
And you know, your family would send you. I, I would need a uniform. My folks would get it and send it to me. And everybody got mail. We, you got to know the people that you're with. You got to know all their family. We read each other's mail. We all read what we got letters from home and you shared when you got food. So you, you were very close to one another. You really, you really were. It was like, uh, it was like family. So I think a lot of us, uh, I think nurses probably kept in touch with each other after the war too, for a long time. Did you ever attend any reunions or ceremonies? No, no, not that great, no. But uh, were you able to maintain any correspondence or you know, see each other infrequently? Oh, I did see some of the, some of the and it's amazing. I knew this fellow uh, who was in the hospital when I was in North Africa. And then he went his own, he, he was split and went another way. And I dated him some, you know, you, it was just, you were all friends and did. And when I went to the university, but I didn't see him after that. When I went to the University of Chicago, the first day I went to International House and I went to have uh, supper there. And I'm walking into the dining room at International House and somebody calls my name, and here's this fellow that he was there getting a, a master's in hospital administration. So the year that he was there, you know, we were friends and stuff. The world is small, kind of. The reason I went to the University of Chicago is one of the uh, the doctors, a pharmacist, he had gone to the University of Chicago. He taught at the University of Chicago. So when I decided I wanted to go to school, that's really the reason I picked the University of Chicago, and I was lucky to get in, so. So, uh, that sounds like you had, had quite the privileged experience. I mean, uh, most of the officers and medical staff, you said even most of the, oh, a good deal of the NCOs were professors. Uh, how do you feel that it's your military experience compared to the average soldier? Well, I think my military experience widen my life tremendously. If I hadn't gone in there, I would have probably stayed in Elkhart, Indiana, probably got married and had a family, and that's all I would have ever done. I wouldn't have gone to college or anything. I didn't have the money to go on to college then. And it just opened up the whole life for me. I met all kinds of people, and I traveled all over, and then I had, on the GI Bill, I was able to go to college. And my husband had graduated from Yale, but he wouldn't have had the money to go on to college. And then he went on and went to law school on the GI Bill. So, you know, the Army experience was, I think, great for most people if you didn't get hurt. So did you meet your husband during the service or after the war? No, I met him after the war, after I got out of nurses training. After I got of, uh, at the University of Chicago, I went to New Haven to work as a visiting nurse there. And he was just starting law school at Fordham and I happened to meet him. And so after we dated till he got out of law school and then he got married and he took a job in Torrington and that's how I've ended up in Torrington. So then, um, I guess coming um, back to military experiences, Or was it your time during the war that really solidified your choice of wanting to be a nurse for the rest of your life? Or did you have a fairly good idea of that coming into the into the military? Well, when I got out of, when I grew up, it was depression. So my family wouldn't have had the money to send me to college. So I knew I, nursing was one of the things to do. So I liked being a nurse. And, and then after the war, I... Uh, went on to get a degree in public health, but uh, that's what I wanted to be. But it didn't make me want to stay in or not stay in, you know. I liked being an operating room nurse, but I also liked being a visiting nurse. And then after I had my children, I ended up being a school nurse in the school system. And that was great because I had the hours that the kids were out of school, so. That was being a school nurse was good.
But I did like being an operating room nurse. But today they don't really use nurses as much as they use trained medics, <laughs> trained medical people, but they aren't nurses always that work in the OR. They have some nurses, but a lot of the people are not. But besides the things I did in the Army, I had lots of good times in the service too. I went to the Alla Capri twice, I went to Rome twice, and then I went to, uh, after the war, I went to uh, Israel and Palestine, and I went to uh, Cairo, went out the Sphinx and the Pyramids, rode camels. And I really saw a lot of the world. So how often were you allowed to uh, take these leaves and furloughs? Well, I'm not too sure, probably every six months you got some time off. When I came back from the front lines, we were given R&R, &R, and so I went to the Riviera for seven days. So that was great. And I think it would have cost us a dollar a night at the <laughs> So, uh, So is this how you think the Army dealt with um, the stress of being almost a, a battlefield nurse? You say what? The, uh, would you imagine that these trips, these R&R &R visits, is this how the Army helped you deal with uh, the stress of the operating room? Well, I think just just uh, not exactly being a... Actually, working in the operating room isn't too distressful. You're just doing what you're doing. You're not looking that a person has lost a leg or something. You know, you're just doing your work. So that... Uh, I don't to think it was... A, but everybody needed time off. And so you did get time off. But, you know, being over there two and a half years, uh, one of the times I went to uh, Rome, uh, I was at Capri, and I was dying to get to Rome, and I was, Rome had been cleared then, so everybody was going to Rome, so I somehow left Capri, and I went, somebody told me to go to the airport, and I hitchhiked on a plane and got to Rome with a, another nurse, and we had no orders to be there. We had no orders to stay anywhere. And we met some English officers. And so they took us to at where they were staying. And so we would, they would put us up. And then uh, they took me to a opera that night. <laughs> and so we saw Rome. And then I had to go out to the airport and find a way to get back to my outfit. <laughs> so... You could do a lot of things like that, that today you wouldn't do. I can imagine doing anything without orders today. But we we did a lot of things. We, we had fun, and a lot of times we just didn't do anything special. You know, just worked and went so, to bed and wrote letters and look, wait for your mail to come. How, was it easy to stay in contact with uh, either other servicemen or the folks at home? Well, people, you mean, people wrote back and forth some. Sometimes letters would come late and all. How long would it usually take to uh, for a letter to either travel from you to the recipient in the United States or oh, vice versa? I have no idea. Sometimes you wouldn't get letters mailed for a week or so, and then you would get quite a few letters. So uh, besides the English uh, officers that you met in Rome, uh, did you ever really interact or come across any other allied or Axis nationalities during your deployment? No, no, not really. Not too much, no. So, uh... It was mostly just American people. But, you know, everybody helped each other out. And it was, as I say, when we went to the airport and then we uh, rode on the back of an English truck to get to, uh, to, get to uh, Rome. And then we got there. Then they, as I said, we had no orders. I can't imagine doing a thing like that today. But I was dying to get to Rome. And then I went there a second time when we came back from the front lines. We stopped in Rome again. So I really, and then, you know, I got to Venice on VJ for VJ Day. That was a great time. And uh, 
I have the pictures of holding the stars and stripes and said war's over. That was really good. And one of the things I was saying about the other day, when the atom bomb, we used to get stars and stripes newspaper, and when they said that the atom bomb had dropped, I hadn't the vaguest idea of what that meant. That was no big deal to me. I, I didn't know what atom bomb was. But, uh, we were glad they were dropping, so the war was over, but I had no idea. I don't think too many of us did know how important that was, really, or how dangerous and everything. So, um, speaking of Pacific deployments, um, following VE Day, how did you, the nurses and the doctors, uh, what kind of likelihood did you feel it was that you would be deployed to the Pacific? We were all afraid we were going to have to go on because people that were being, people would get sent back and people were worrying that they would have to go to. And we really thought the war was over, that we would be going home and might have to go. We were worried that we would have to go to the South Pacific. But not everybody would have had to go because there are so many people in. European theater and, and uh, the islands down the Pacific weren't so large, so it was probably more Navy personnel would get killed than Army at that time. But we were really worried that we would have to go. And then when war was over, we hung around and finally we got to Naples and we were sitting around waiting for the ships to come, take us home. And I had a chance to go to um, Switzerland, and I was only going to cost me $35. And we could only take $35 with money with us. And I wanted to go to Switzerland very bad, but they said, if we went, we might not get back for the next boat. And I was dying to get home, so I didn't go. And they went to Switzerland and came back. We were still sitting there waiting for a boat, so I was always sorry that I hadn't gone on the jet. And a lot of the nurses were upset because a lot of the fellas that had married Italian girls, the Italian wives were being sent home on boats before we were getting sent home, and everybody was pretty mad about that. That's one of the reasons they set up letting you go to Switzerland, because <laughs> they had a lot of you guys. angry people <laughs> sitting there in Naples, <laughs> foaming at the mouth trying to get home. And going overseas, we had this uh, big Norwegian uh, uh, ship, and we had uh, we sat at round tables with white tablecloths, and we were the officers. We were treated like royalty, but coming home, the ships were very crowded, and and uh, we had to stand in a chow line with our mess kit like everybody else. And but we were so happy to come home; we didn't mind. Uh, you achieved the rank of first lieutenant. First, yeah. Now, uh, did you have to participate in an officer candidate school or any other kind of officer training program in order to gain that rank? When you went in, you were when, when you were enlisted, you enlisted as a first, a second lieutenant. And then it was just after a while before we went to Italy that I was made a first lieutenant. They raised him, uh, but. Uh, so did you have any... Um, I didn't have to do anything to become a first lieutenant. Uh, did you have anybody under your command then, uh, being an officer? Did I have what? Uh, did you um, have anybody under your command? Did you have any kind of um, you know, orderlies or any kind of team that you would direct? Or were most of the medical staff uh, that you were deployed with officers? Well, all the people that helped us in the operating room were lots of enlisted men and all. No, we would we would uh, meet with them too, kind of, but we didn't eat with them. And when there was parties or anything, the non-commissioned officers had their parties, but and the officers had their parties. So uh, at one time in North Africa, we had a colonel that nobody liked at our hospital, and everybody was going to get, they came out to interview people because they were going to move him out. You know, a lot of people were just doctors coming in and he didn't know how to handle a group of people and there were a lot of people that didn't run things very well. And then we had a going away party for him though. 
And I can remember that I was on entertainment and I remember singing, oh my man, I love him so <laughs> at the piano. We didn't like him, but we were happy to see him leave. <laughs> so it was, so there would be things like that. So generally, um, what did you think of your, uh, your fellow officers and enlisted men? Oh, like everything else, some of them you liked more than others, some of We didn't, uh, our first uh, woman that was ahead of us, she was a captain, I think. We thought she was awfully old. She probably was her 40s, you know. <laughs> we thought she was an awfully old lady at the time. But uh, uh, no, they didn't, we didn't have too much trouble with them. We did our own things and... Uh, there wasn't, there wasn't too much work with them. Just like being an office or something, like, you know, you have your boss, but you know what you're supposed to do. So I... But there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of funny things that happen, a lot of I remember all of the trips I took and the good times you had. And I certainly liked it going to, uh, they had this colonel that was taking trips to, I don't know if I should tell the story, but they were taking trips to uh, Cairo and uh, Egypt, uh, Palestine. And uh, this was after the end of the war, so there was nothing to do. And these people were going on these trips and coming back. and. So the fellow I was dating at that time worked in the colonel's office, and he asked me if I'd like to go on one of those trips to Cairo. And I said, sure. And he said, well, there's a little problem. He said, you have to take $500 with you. And you can spend it if you want to, but if you don't spend it, there was a deal on it. So I had an awful, I went to the Red Cross to see if they would loan me $500 for money. They wouldn't give me a cent. Here I am. I'm going to get my paycheck. I don't know how I was able to manage the $500. So I gave it to this Jack, the fellow I was dating. So he had $1,000. He carried it on a money belt with him. And what happened is that we were paid in Italian lire. And we went someplace that we landed. It was changed to Egyptian pounds. And then it was changed to English pounds. And so we had this money to spend. But what we had left, we had to turn the money into the finance officer. They gave us our money back in Lear. And they were making money on the pounds. Now, I didn't know that was going to happen. So, see, I'm a black market person, too, I guess. But that, uh, that, th he did that on several, on several trips. And he and the finance officer and somebody, they were, they just exchanged the money and they made money on the money. I mean, we didn't have to, it, we could spend it all if we wanted to, but if we didn't, we got our money back, but it, we got, we had Lear and we got it back in Lear, but it was changed into pounds and money was made on that, I'm sure. So, did you get the 500 back? Oh yeah, I got the money. Oh yeah. But no, we got everything back. But you didn't get the extra difference? But we didn't, uh, we had no dealings with that. But, uh, and when I went to the Riviera, <laughs> we used to be given cigarettes. I think we got two cartons of cigarettes free a week, I think. We used to get a cart. And I went to the Riviera, and uh, they said you could uh, get barter, I guess, you don't want to call it black mark, barter, cigarette. I I got some perfume for two cartons of cigarettes. I'm not so sure the perfume was any good. I'd send it to some friend, but I was afraid to do any of that. But people did those kind of things. Like the fellows, the enlisted men, they all had uh, uh, mattress cover pad, mattress covers. A white cloth and that was worth a lot of money and so the fellows would sell the mattress to the French people there and then come a time when they're having inspection then 
everybody's trying to dig up a mattress cover to put on their mattress because they they get, I don't know what happened to them, but they got in bad trouble. So everybody was doing a little bit of that, the service. Now, um, women's nylons were also very rare at the time. Were, when, you issued, were you issued those by the Army? When I what? Uh, also, what was that? I think I remember reading that uh, women's nylons, uh, you know, the hosiery, was, uh, was a rare item. Oh, yes, yes. That was, was that another black market item? Well, we had, no, uh, we had one nurse that, uh, she was a, a Jewish girl whose father had, uh, he could get stuff. And she would get so cold. We would always like it because she could get pastrami sent to her nuns. She would always get so cold, and we couldn't get so cold at all. So that was a very hard thing to get. But this Mildred, she we were always happy when she got her. Uh, she had an end that she could uh, get this. I think he was an import expert, and so he's able to get stuff for her and send it to her. So, so uh, was I mean um, from other veterans' accounts, it seems like that whole system of barter, you know, oh, with cigarettes, oh and sure, chocolate bars, yeah, uh, was that an, almost an everyday phenomenon? That kind of trading. Oh, probably, and a lot of times chocolate bars and stuff, fellows just to give them to the kids because there are a lot of French. Uh, there were French kids up in uh, and then uh, in North Africa, of course, and uh, they wanted stuff and uh, like soap was so they didn't have soap, so you know they were so happy to get a bar of soap when we because we would get the soap and then we give it to them to do our clothes, and then some and we would have. Uh, dried eggs that they could make up, and that's what we would get uh, uh, eggs. But every now and then, the word would go along that there were going to be fresh eggs in Italy and then Africa, and everybody go to breakfast that day. <laughs> fresh eggs, and I never was a milk drinker, so I didn't mind that we had that we didn't have fresh milk. But uh, that's one of the things the fellows seemed to miss a lot was eggs. Uh, milk. And when we were in Bari Italy at the end of the war, then a lot of prisoners of war came back to us. We got some of them that landed in, in uh, Italy. And I can remember these fellows were so hungry and they wanted food, you know, but you didn't dare give them too much to eat because it would have made them very sick. But they all wanted milk. But you had to be careful not to feed them too much right away, because they wouldn't, their body wouldn't be able to do it. So we saw them, but they weren't as they were. They didn't look as bad as some of the pictures you see of prisoners of war. I think I think they were done sort of at the end of the war. You know, they were the ones bombing right at the end. But we did get those at the end when we come back. So. Um was that commonplace at the end of the war? Were you handling um, a lot of Allied and German prisoners through your uh, medical evacuations? No, no, we didn't take it. Do we didn't do any of that? That was all up in northern Italy, and that's where the no, we didn't take care of any of those. Though my husband was working in a, at a prison camp at the end. Uh, did you, uh, were you familiar or did you know any of the nurses that um, dealt with or assisted um, any survivors of German concentration camps? No, I didn't know any of that. We didn't, see, we weren't up in France and Germany, so we didn't see those. And I, I uh, don't know of any nurses that, I don't know what happened, what, where they went. I suppose they must have gone to American hospitals, but I never ever heard about how they took care of those people and where they went. I, I'm not, I don't know that at all. Um, uh, what was the reaction uh, when you, you know, among the American servicemen and the Allies? when uh, they discovered uh, the camps in Germany and Eastern Europe? Well, you know, we got the, <laughs> no TV or any of that kind of stuff, radio. So we got started to try for, I wasn't aware 
aware of how bad that was at the time. That was in Italy. I, I didn't understand. I didn't know about the. I had never heard about that there were uh, camps like that. And I don't think we didn't see any pictures or any of that at the end. It wasn't until later that that came out. So I really didn't know. And I was thinking the day when I was thinking about things. When I got our nurses training, I was a, uh, worked as a private duty nurse. That's because everybody that had money always had private duty nurses. And the first job I had was probably around the 1st of September. And I was uh, to care of this man who just had his appendix out. But he had a private duty nurse. And uh, he was president of some big firm, a very nice man. And on the radio that night, it came on that Germany had invaded Poland that night. So it must have been around the 1st of September. And he told me how significant that was. But I had no idea that that was, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know that was bad. That, well, I knew it was bad Germany invaded, but I didn't realize how important that was. That it would have started the war. That started the war. And, but I but I do remember that and that. He told me that, but, uh, you know, when you grow up in Indiana and never been much for anything, you didn't know all of that. Were you much, um, I'm sure that you were much more moved when you heard the attack on Pearl Harbor? Oh, yes. Do you remember where you were when you Yes, I do. I, I was, I had this friend of mine, he, he was at the port of embarkation, he was dating a girl that I knew, and we had a couple French, uh, seamen, I think, that were visiting there. And we were going around and looking at some of the places in Charleston to see. And I have pictures of it taking that. And then we went, he was at the port of embarkation, so we went back to the officers' club at the port of embarkation. And when we got over there, it was announced that Pearl Harbor had happened. So everybody was directed to go back to their places right away, so we all had to go back. And Christmas Eve that year, because we were in Charleston right on the water, and I guess maybe they were thinking people in U-boats would be coming up and trying, and maybe some of them did, I don't remember. But we were all given gas masks that Christmas Eve, and we had to try them on and stuff. And, then, you know, but we never had to use them, but that's just that was one of the things it is. We all got gas masks on Christmas Eve. And then we, we could still wear street clothes. And then I'm not just sure when we had to go into uniform. And so we would have dances at the off, at the country club there in Charleston and all the Charleston blue blood girls were there in their beautiful evening gowns with all of the officers. And we had to go in a uniform. So I had the nerve to go make an appointment to see the general there and uh, or the colonel or somebody and at the head anyway the head man there thought so, and asking if we could please wear uniforms to or please wear evening gowns to go to the dance. So he gave me permission that we could go, but we couldn't go off the post afterwards. So I said, Okay. So I guess the dances that we were going to were on the post. But as I say, all the city girls could come in there. So we got uh, permission to do it. Of course, some of the people afterwards went off the post in their evening guns, but I didn't because I had stuck my neck out to get permission to do that. It's a lot of funny things that happen. It sounds like the um, in the group of nurses or the medical field, um, You were very social. Yes. Yeah. Well, a lot of people were. Some weren't, but usually like a, uh, these dances, these functions that you talk about, would they um, would they happen on base? You know, at the field hospital. Oh yeah, yeah. And how would they set that up? Well, I guess you got to know people, and and maybe somebody fixed you up with a date or something too, or somebody knew. But there were always probably more men than women. Not everybody had a date all the time, but you know. And people would come in, then they move out. More people come in, the port of embarkation, and they'd go at the officer's club, and you'd meet people, and uh, uh, that's how you dated people. So, 
Now, uh, when you deployed overseas, uh, in anticipation of these events, uh, I recall you mentioned that your parents sent you an evening dress. Uh, did you bring one with you when you uh, first went to Africa? Did I what? Did you bring an evening dress with you when you first went to Africa? No, 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 huh? no, I hadn't taken that. So, And then towards the end of the war, I was also one of my friends, this Dottie that, this, that I show pictures of, she got married while she was over there at the end, and I was going to be able to be her bridesmaid, and I was going to try to get a dress in that. And then it fell through. I couldn't be where she was, so. Uh, but she married one of the fellows, and uh, for her wedding dress, her the fellow she was dating, he uh, got a, a silk uh, parachute, and he had the nuns in a convent over, he was in Sicily at the time, I think, and he had them make her her wedding dress out of the uh, parachute silk. Yeah, so, but I never saw it because I didn't get to go to the wedding. Now, was but, that a frequent occurrence? Did um, a lot of these... Towards the end, there were people getting married. Yeah, some of them were getting... Not a lot. Uh, these were nurses and uh, doctors and some of the nurses. And then uh, at the end, there were two weddings that I was involved with this matter. You have that picture where, when, where I, I'm on the ground sleeping with this big suitcase. Right, right. Well, I had this big suitcase, and I took it overseas. And when we are at, uh, I think we were at Fort Dix, I don't know. But anyway, people were trying to pack stuff, and I had this big suitcase. So I said, well, here you can put some in my suitcase, I said, you know. I never dreamed that I'd have to carry my own suitcase. And we get to the port of embarkation. I have to lug this big, heavy suitcase. I thought I'd die. But I carried that suitcase all through the... And one of the girls, when she got married, she took that suitcase on her honeymoon. <laughs> she married one of the dentists there. I visited them once. They lived up in Minnesota. I kept in track with quite a few of the people and quite a few of the nurses over the years. But like everything else and everybody, you have your own life and that. So how do you feel that um, your experience in the military shaped your views on war? I, I, wouldn't get, I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. It was the biggest thing that could have happened to me that turned out well. As I think it did to many, many people. I think, you know, most of the teachers that we had, men teachers do, all were the results of all those fellows going to school and getting a degree. And most of the men teachers over the years had a lot, awful lot of them went to school on the GI Bill. That was certainly a worthwhile thing. And um, when you read about or uh, see images from current wars, like uh, what we have in Iraq and Afghanistan, how does your military experience um, affect your views of, uh, of those current conflicts? Like how, how do you feel about them? Well, feel about I used to be a liberal Democrat, but now I'm a conservative. I saw the light <laughs> after years. I, uh, I think it was terrible people the way people were treated after Vietnam. And I certainly think you ought to support the troops. I mean, there's good and bad things in all of life and war, too, but uh, I, I'm certainly sports troops. Uh, going back to uh, your deployment in Europe, with uh, all the visitation after the war, after VE Day, uh, how easy was it to, um, to get a pass and travel? Did you have to get orders, or oh yes, you had to give or you had to have orders to go. Uh, you had to have orders to go to. Uh, when I went to Capri, I always had orders that you had. Whenever you went anywhere, you had to have permission to go off. I had orders to go to. Uh, Capri the first time, and then I left Capri without orders and went to Italy, <laughs> went to Rome. But otherwise, I always had orders to go somewhere. It was just like you had permission to go on vacation or permission to go. And at the end, things were, 
you know, you didn't have that much to do. People were going home and there was still a hospital where there were still people were sick and all, but most that age people were fairly well. You didn't have too much illness. So they were letting people have go places and do things. And it was always very cheap. I think it was a dollar a night at Capri or something too, you know, it was not expensive at all. Because you the army was paying for your quarters really. The army had taken over these places for people to go. Now, um, what was the celebration like overseas on VE Day? What was the what? Uh, what was uh, what was the celebration for VE Day like when it was overseas? Um, well, we were up in uh, we were in Venice, so that was a pretty happy time. <laughs> I we we're going on a gondola and meeting in the offices. I remember this one time. That one evening, we went to a, a bar or a hotel there that I think the English were in charge of. And so you could get, they served liquor from 6 to 6.30. I never drank hardly anything, but a lot of the people drank a lot. I still never drank much of anything, but just because I, I don't much care for it. But the people, everybody would go to the bar and get as many drinks as they could come, and the table would be full of drinks, you know. And I can remember that evening afterwards, I was with us. I had gone up there to Venice. Well, a bunch of us went, but I was dating a fellow at the time. And he had had several drinks there. And we got in the gondola, and we're out, a whole bunch of us in the gondola in the moonlight, and this fellow falls asleep. <laughs> so there was a lot of drinking. That was what they did. They drank. I never... I never drank much of anything, and I never really smoked. I, and I started to learn to smoke because I found that if I was at a, with a drink, I could just leave the drink there sort of, and as long as I had something in my hands, I, I didn't feel any. I, I would, so I smoked for about 11 years, and I quit. But I started to smoke so that I could, didn't need to drink as much because that's all you did is went to the officer come and drank. And they'd have a dance and stuff, but people went and drank. That's what they did for a bit. That's where you want the officers club. So, um... I don't even remember that we went to the officers club and had dinners, really. I'm not so sure that we did. We just went... And we just went to, like, go to a bar to meet people. And would it just be um, officers from your uh, medical unit or from divisions in the area? Well, it's... Usually you had an officer's club for your own place, but of course, like in Venice or someplace, uh, everybody's there. I can remember when we went to uh, Capri the first time, and we were sitting around, and it was almost time to go upstairs, and I saw one of the fellas take his wedding ring off, and I thought, oh, who do you think you are? <laughs> so a lot of that going on. <laughs> oh, <wow>. um. <laughs> But uh, quite a, it sounds like there's quite a bit of dating going on. Overseas. Well, yes, there was dating. Yes, well, Is yes. That one of the ways that you dealt with the stress of your situation. That's right. People, and there were lots of people who were married. The men were married, probably the women weren't, and they weren't all unfaithful to their wives. I think you had to do something. You couldn't sit for two years and not look around. So you, you did go. Uh, and a lot of the officers, we didn't like them either, you know. So, <laughs> a lot of them we didn't. <laughs> there probably a lot of them didn't like us either, so it's like it's like anything else, you know. But and what was the stereotype at the time? You mentioned it before off camera, but uh, what was it? The nurses would usually go for the generals? For the what? Uh, what was it? Uh, somebody uh, made a comment to you about how you were the, um, the only nurse who was dating a lieutenant or who married a lieutenant. That I was the only one. That, the only nurse that married a lieutenant. Oh no, I. Oh, oh no, my husband said. said right, right. My husband right. said that he never dated a nurse because the nurses only went with generals. He said so. If he had seen me, I wouldn't have had anything to do with him. But uh, I said that wasn't true. I, I think this one fellow might have been a captain at the end. That was. Uh, intelligence officer up in uh, Florence.
But then you would write, and then after a while you wouldn't write to somebody, you know. But it was, yeah, it, you need somebody to talk to and be for two and a half years of your life. It's like if you go to college, right. you just, you have friends. It doesn't mean that you're boyfriend, girlfriend. You can have lots of friends and do things with. But. So uh, speaking of ways to deal with stress, um, did you ever experience or know anybody in the service who um, suffered from symptoms of post-traumatic stress? No, there wasn't any of that back then, I don't think. I, there probably was, but oh, I'm sure there were. We had a lot of people that, we had this hospital in South Carolina, and a lot of people that came there, they were they were given Section 8s because a lot of people didn't want to go overseas. Now, we had we had a lot of that in the States where they didn't go overseas because they couldn't handle having to go overseas. I never worked in one of those wards, but some of the people did. I were, Quite a bit of the time I worked in a, a heart ward, a cardiac ward, because there were fellows who had come there and they'd have heart problems and then they probably wouldn't go overseas, you know. And uh, I became quite good friends with uh, one of the cardiologists there and his wife and all. They had a place down there and I used to go to them. And I I also, I was in the hospital once with pneumonia and the lady next to me was the wife of the general of the port of embarkation there. And I was friendly with her, so I got to be friends with them and I'd go over to their house and stuff and their children. So, you know, you made friends sort of off too. But, uh, I made I made so many friends of people of all walks of life that I didn't keep friends always, but it certainly widens your outlook on life. Um, did you ever experience any discrimination as a woman among the United States Army? No, no, no. And I think of times when we used to go place going somewhere, we'd hitchhike, you never felt, uh, you know, you never always felt safe, like when we were hitchhiking to go up to Rome, and all. you always, people, you know, if you're part of the army, you, know, you always felt safe, people take care of you. That wouldn't be the case today, unfortunately, sadly to say, but. No, I think I had there are good experiences, and I think an awful lot of people did. If they had bad experiences within their own personal life, probably, from where I was now. I mean, it was tough on the front lines. It was just four and a half months I was there, but you know, it was winter and cold, and, and you, it, it was tough living, but we were young, and it, and that didn't seem bad to me, in a way. In the winter months, um, did you sleep in tents, or did you have shelters? No, we were in a, we had a, sh a tent, and a uh, wood like? stove, and uh, I, did I tell you the time when I burned my hand at the wood stove? Uh, oh, if you could tell it on the camera. I'll tell <laughs> um, I was in the frontline hospitals then, and, and it was... Uh, it was they it was very cold now. We had uh, four people in a tent, a pyramidal tent, and you'd have a pot-bellied stove, and they would bring you green wood, and it wouldn't burn. And you're way up in northern Italy, and they'd bring us diesel fuel to pour over it and light it, and then it would burn a little bit. And this one time, I was in one hospital, and I was told I'd gone to work, and I was told that I was going to have to go back and pack up, and we were going to have to move to a new hospital. So I left the operating room saying, I'm going to get a fire started or else. So we would give, give them diesel fuel, but this time the fellows had brought a five-gallon can of high-octane gas. Was, and I knew it was, but I didn't realize how dangerous it was. And so I went back and I took a little peanut can, a very small can, and poured just a little bit of high-octane gas, and I poured it on the wood, and I stepped back, and I took a stars and stripes, and I lit it with a piece, of, and I stuck it into the thing, and the thing exploded, just in one thing. It burned my hand, singed my eyebrows, because we have a dirt floor. It was just one 
flash. And uh, I ran back to the operating room. I'd been burned. I, and they were very unhappy with me because I was a scrub nurse. It took a few days before I could scrub because my hand had gotten, not blistered, but it had gotten burned. And I made up my mind I would never start a fire again. I'd freeze to death. And we had some bad experiences where fellows tried to keep warm, pouring high-octane gas on stuff and had, uh, had some bad burns. But you know, you're cold and you figure it, the wood won't burn. And uh, But I know better than that now with gas. But I had no idea that a little bit of can of gas, I didn't know about, I honestly didn't know about fumes. I know now. I would never do that. So what were the majority of uh, battlefield injuries that you um, either witnessed or treated? Uh, yes, we would have to amputate a leg, but they didn't have like the IIDs today where they get all their things blown off. It was, they would get shot and uh, uh, we would, a lot of it with debridement, we'd have to take the shrapnel out. A lot of it was not real serious, but you'd have to take all the shrapnel. And sometimes I scrub for a neurosurgeon and people would get shot in the head, but it was mostly shrapnel wounds. Otherwise, it was real serious, they probably would have died. And people had uh, would get shot in the abdomen, so they'd have to have colostomies or something, and they'd, lungs, and you'd have to, uh, but... Uh, so what was the mood like in the operating room at this time? How was the food? Uh, the mood. Uh, Always. Was, was, was everybody able to keep calm? It's like any operating room. You're, you're sometimes making jokes. You see some mash. Mash is probably a little exaggerated, but you do make jokes to break tension or talk. It isn't just never saying anything. You couldn't you couldn't hold up if you did that. I can remember one patient begging a doctor not to cut his leg off, but he had to because he had gangrene. But most of the people, I guess, were probably had already gotten their anesthesia before they came into the operating room. But did you ever treat any self-inflicted wounds? No, I don't think I did. No, but we did have self. Mostly, they were in the feet. They would shoot their own foot, but it was always obvious, and that was the line of duty. No, they would probably got a dishonorable discharge. Now, uh, you hear quite a few stories of uh, trench foot and dishonorable discharges. Did that would be, uh, but uh, uh, we didn't we didn't have that. The people that we saw were casualties of firearms and stuff. The, the trench foot probably didn't get to a hospital for quite a while. Like, the Battle of the Bulge. Eventually those fellows must have had to get to a hospital somewhere, but I wasn't in that part of the thing, so. Ours was all the results of firearms or the Air, P Air Force people. Uh, a great many of them were burned. Some of them may have got shot too, but a lot of them, a lot of the bad were badly burned too. But. Most of the time they said that the kind of wounds we got, if they got to our hospital, we saved most of them. If they're really bad, maybe they would have died before they got there. For today, maybe if you get a helicopter, maybe you can get them back. But I think the injuries are much more serious today with the IEDs and stuff. The, the injuries are, uh, you know, people riding in a truck and getting it blown up. It's a, it's a different kind of a war. And I can see where there would be much more stress, post-traumatic stress. Because you never know when what was going to happen to you. Uh, so was life and routine um, more or less the day-to-day -day where you were stationed uh, was pretty even? Like one day... Um, was pretty much like another? Yes, I think so. I think all the days are more or less alike. Except we're in North Africa, sometimes we would get in loads of patients. 
And then loads of patients would leave us <laughs> and they'd get in more. But uh, no, it's pretty much the same every day. And in the front lines too, you get all the patients in. It seemed like we always had patients coming in. It wasn't quite like MASH, but some of it was kind of like MASH. The nurses were never like Loretta Swift. Or <laughs> we are just very <laughs> proper. Uh, no, we were like everybody else, I guess. And was your unit, um, well, aside from the, uh, the surgical team from the university, uh, from all, all parts of the country, all walks of life? Yes, but the, the people at the, in the 26th general, all the nurses and most of the doctors were all people that worked there. Now, the enlisted personnel were probably from somewhere else that were attached to that. But almost everybody's name was Swenson or Johnson or everybody's name ended in S-O-N just about. <laughs> They're all sweet, you know, that an awful lot of them were, yeah. <laughs> they were all nice people, but they were a clique. And we, I came in as an outsider, and some of us did. So uh, I never felt as, as much a part of them as uh, the other place Which where we all started together. And uh, did that unit stay together till the end of the war? I don't know what happened to them afterwards. They probably all probably went back to the University of Minnesota and were working there. Those that stayed and they would just be regular hospital people rather than army people. Well, like I knew two nurses that stayed in the army. But uh, uh, not all of them. I didn't know all of you know. A lot of people just went back and got married and went to school or something. Actually, the two girls that stayed in the service, unfortunately, were girls who dated fellows that were married, and they loved them. But and they, I think, the people liked them too. But they were away. But they went home back to their wives and. The girls didn't. Uh, that's life, I guess. But that happened, you know, people are gone two, two and a half years, they're together. Uh, it's unfortunate. And there was no going back to visit like today, you know. Right. I see sometimes where people get excited because these people have to go for nine months. We were two and a half years, we never saw anybody we knew, you know. Uh, didn't you get a, a Dear Jane letter? Yourself? Yeah, but that was after the service. Oh, okay. That was after, but back home. I see. Yeah, you know, but other than that, no, no, I didn't. Get it. <laughs> well, it sounds like things worked out. Yeah. You got yeah, they, your lieutenant. Yes, you know, I've had a very good life. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've uh, I've done an awful lot of things in my life that I certainly would never have done if I had stayed in Elkhart, Indiana. It sounds like you've helped quite a few people through the medical. Yeah, I've, uh, and I was glad that I kept in touch with many of the people over the years. As I say, I just know one nurse now that uh, she uh, she seemed to be happy in her life. She's real Irish. Oh, she didn't like the English people. <laughs> no, she really was anti-English. <laughs> She's very Irish. Uh, would you care to have any closing comments? Well, I uh, I think it's uh, kind of interesting to know all the things that people did do in World War II. People forget it. I'm very happy that I went into the service. I had good things happen to me. And I certainly think that GI Bill was a wonderful thing. And I hope that everybody coming out of the service now has an opportunity to better their lives going back. I think they deserve going back to get a college education or some kind of a thing to help with them when they get out. And I'm amazed that I'm still here telling this story <laughs> at 92. <laughs> well, we're very glad to hear it. And, uh... and I, as I said, you know, it, it, all this happened because two years ago I 
I had told my kids, I, if I were younger, I would go down. I'd been to Washington, but I'd never been to the World War II Museum. And I said, I'd, I'd like to go. So they said, well, we'll take it. I said, no, 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 I can't walk that far. And they said, well, we'll get you a wheelchair. No, no, no. I said, well, on my 90th birthday, they said, we're going to Washington. So we did go down. And they did give me a wheelchair some of the time because I have a little time walking too far. And I had a wonderful time. And so while I was at the World War II Museum, I typed in my name and nothing came up. And then my daughter got on the phone and called and they wanted to know, had I got any awards and stuff? And I said, I don't know, you know, I think. So when we came home, my son, uh, he checked out and he saw that I could get all these medals and stuff. So that's when I, then finally when I got these medals and the veterans here in town, my son said to him, he'd seen her a lady before who'd been a nurse, but she hadn't even gone overseas with the honorary marshal. So he said, I think my mother ought to be an honorary marshal. <laughs> I was sort of embarrassed about it. But finally we did, and I had a great time. I rode in the uh, rumble seat of a 1932 Cadillac, went through town waving like the queen, and oh no, we had a big party here. I had so much fun. And uh, our representative was going to come over and personally deliver the, my medals, but he was busy, so somebody else brought the medals over, and then uh, uh, so my son put them up in this frame. So we had that's how this all started. <laughs> so that's how I. But uh, we had a great time. Yeah, I did have a fun at the at the parade last year. Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly glad to hear your story. And well, thank, thank you. you very much for your service. Well, thank you. And uh, and I enjoyed sharing things with it. I kept all this stuff all these years. Yeah.